Hey, what's up guys? It's Tobin. This is screencast number 30. Yes, I'm still alive. Uh, I've been uh, really kind of crazy busy on different things lately, so I apologize. I haven't posted or made a screencast in quite a while. Uh, I had a relative, uh, well basically a relative with abandonment issues because I had been in touch and I checked my Verizon wireless bill last month. Last month I talked on the phone for nine minutes. Total. Even for a slightly autistic weirdo like me, um, that's not very much. So very busy, but I'm starting to get on the other side of that and I'll have more time to do some, some blog posts and screencasts. This one we're going to talk about D3. We have a project called the Quality of Life Dashboard, which I've talked about a number of times. Uh, it's basically quality of life for neighborhoods across 80 plus different metrics. It's used by a, a wide range of people with particular needs for that sort of thing. Uh, that site worked out very well. People really liked it. In terms of that kind of site, it was, it was quite good. It won some awards and I hate everything about it because I made it like more than a year ago and everything I made a year ago I look at it now and I just hate everything about it mm -hmm. and that's a good sign that means as a developer you're you're progressing over time uh, it also means you're prone to go rewriting stuff a lot but I hate everything about the old one and it just came up that we're gonna start working on the new one way ahead of time like this isn't supposed to be out till this time next year so it's really premature but anyway some of the other project parties are starting to get together and work on it I thought I would make a visualization with D3 kind of show what we can do and visualize and that will probably be the way we go and that's one of the nice th one of the nice things about being so far in ahead of time I'm not going to be worrying about Internet Explorer 8 at this time next year if I have to worry about Internet Explorer 8 this time next year I'm going to quit and go raise alpacas because that just shouldn't happen. So everything should support SVG and everything should work fine. Now D3 is kind of hard. It's uh, not hard and like there's something wrong with this library hard. It's a brilliant, great, great library. But it's kind of hard because it's doing hard and complicated things. It is not uh, abstracting away what you're doing. When you make a circle, you are actually in JavaScript pretty much drawing out an SVG circle. You're setting the CX and CY and the radius properties. and So it's, it's hard, but it's worth, it, it's worth sitting down with it and just for a week and just banging your head against it and grokking how it does things and why it does things the way it does. Very, very good library. Let me show you the old site, and it's kind of like this. And it's okay. I hate everything about it, but it's, it's all right. Things I particularly don't like about it now are uh, I'm starting to get not so into these big header areas. It's eh, kind of a waste. Uh, people usually know the site they went to. You can make it smaller. It puts a big, it's very, very dense, very information dense. And I want to get that density down by quite a bit. That density is kind of off-putting. It's so dense. It puts a premium on this contextual information that I guarantee you no one really reads. So I want to demote that in the visual hierarchy. And even the page hierarchy, I'm getting it way down at the bottom. In terms of visualizations, you get like this one bar chart which shows you the county mean and your selected neighborhood's mean. So you can see how you are with the rest of the county. Not terribly interesting. So, yeah, hate everything about it. This is what I'm thinking of for the new release, and this is very raw. And what I'm going to do for the GitHub repo, because the whole Quality Life Dashboard project's out on GitHub. Feel free to do whatever you want with it. Um, I'm going to make a dev branch for that uh, for that repo and then stick what the new version will be in there. So that way you can play around with any of that code if you want. Warning, uh, there are developers that like when they 
They'll be like, before I write my first line of JavaScript code, I write my first 87 unit tests and then try to shoehorn it into the most complicated MVC framework I can find, all while, you know, chanting a mantra to Douglas Crockard. Not me. My, uh, my initial code is a hot pile of shit. So when you look at it, expect that. It's, it's not very good. I'm not, I'm violating the dry principle, don't repeat yourself, all over the place. Be forewarned, it is early days. But you're welcome to look at it and do whatever you want with it. This is kind of the layout what I'm thinking in a in a raw a raw sense. Uh, you notice it's mu there's much more air in it. It is much a hundred times less dense. So you can immediately grok it and get your eyes around it, and it's much more visually pleasing. It's less of a visual assault. Um, there's like four pieces to it right now. There's basically a drop down where you can pick two metrics I've just set up with fake data, and a map, and a chart, and a time slider. Now, the, this is kind of interesting. The chart is the legend, and the legend is the chart. I got this idea from a project called Crosslet, which is Leaflet and Crosslet, no, Crossleaf, which is Leaflet and D3 and Crosslet. Or something like that. I'll put a link to it in show notes. But he had a chart and I looked at it and the bars on the chart were actually the colors of the map. It was the legend. Thought that is friggin' genius. So of course I stole that. And and props go to go to that guy and I'll put a link to it. But you can see the uh, chart is the map and the map is the chart. That's the legend. That's really neat. You also get by displaying it this way. The y-axis is the number of neighborhoods in that quantile. So you not only get the legend in the chart, you get the distribution of data. You can see how many neighborhoods are in each quantile. You can see where the data is distributed across the map. That's also something we didn't have before. Very, very interesting. And finally, and this will be a better visualization than it is right now, I just have a little circle representing the, the mean for that metric. So these things are all interconnected. So when I hover over a neighborhood, you can see on the chart, it highlights that quantile that neighborhood is in. It also puts a dot exactly where that neighborhood value is. I'm gonna do something better than these dots, which is what I have right now. So as you move around the, the map, you can see the dots move. See where it is in relation to the mean. You also see what quantile it's in. And when you stop your mouse, you'll see in a pop-up what the value for that specific neighborhood is there as well. Uh, the chart is similarly linked back to the map. If you hover over a quantile, you will see what the value range is for that quantile, as well as it highlights on the map every neighborhood within that quantile. So it's this back and forth relationship that's that's we didn't have before. Very, very cool. I think they're gonna like it when they see it. Also hover over the mean, and you're getting the quantile when you hover over the chart. These are all very interactive back and forth. And I have that, you can see the breakdown, the, the value range for the quantile, because I know, I mean, talking to some GIS pinheads, they'll be like, well, yeah, the legend is a chart, but I can't see what the number range is now exactly. I have to look at the bottom of the chart. Like anyone really, Gives a shit about that, but you know, now now you can you get those numbers. So, shut. Up. So, you can change the year either by moving the slider. And you notice when you do that, it doesn't doesn't just you know snap like a graphic just change. The map very quickly fades in, and the bars animate to a different height. And these values are all very close because I tried to make it a not on a realistic change over time for these examples. But you can see that tiny little ball move a little bit. You can also hit this play button and it's just got a little timer that's scrolling through these. It'd be more interesting if we had more than two years, but, we, but uh, that's all we're gonna have when this comes out. When you change the, uh, the metric, the bars animate and the map changes. And down below it is all the contextual information that no one gives a crap about. 
because that's where it belongs in the bottom. So all of this complexity, one, it's laid out in a much neater, cleaner way, so it's not as dense and intimidating, and it's all down at the bottom. And people may not even scroll that far, and why should they? No one cares about where your data came from. So that's the interaction. That's how that's how I'm thinking after a lot of cleanup and you know little stuff here and there this is gonna work. Right now I just have this as a D3 SVG map. Um, it will probably go like D3 as a layer on leaflet at some point. That's really how all, all, all that works. This is pretty much straight up regular uh, D3. I will show you a couple things that are that might be gotchas. Uh, first, one thing I do, which D3 and all the examples, most of the code you find online, the first thing they do is append an SVG to the page and start building from like the ground up. I don't like that. Uh, unless that's a spot where you don't know whether an SVG is really going to go there or not. I don't like that. One, you're DOM thrashing. You're just injecting stuff into the DOM. If you already know it's going to be there, just have it there up front. And two, it's just a lot more complex in terms of coding, especially maintenance over the long term, having all that in JavaScript. So if you have a map, you know it's going to be there. Just put the framework, at least the holder stuff, um, for that map right in your document. And here for the chart, I actually put in the groups for the, the bars and the x-axis, axis, axis, um, and those little mean circles. So those are all right in the chart. Oh, I, I hear my board coming home. I should close this door here. So I put that right in the DOM from the get-go. Um, it's just a less expensive way to go in terms of performance, and it's less expensive in terms of coding and code maintenance over the long term. My opinion. That's just kind of my style. Could be wrong about that. It would be handy if you don't know if the browser supports SVG or not, to not put the SVG in there up front, and to have it either do some old-timey stuff there, or just pop up an image and say, hey, uh, even the Amish are on 9 now. But when this launches, it's going to be this time next year, and I will not give a flying anything about people still on i8 at that point. So that's one thing I do that's a little different. Um, these uh, tooltips are bootstrap tooltips. To get those to work on SVG Element, you absolutely must do not pass go, do not collect anything. You must, when you make the tooltip, uh, put container body as an option. Otherwise, Bootstrap doesn't know where to put that in relation to an SVG, and uh, you're screwed, it's not gonna work. So put that there or you'll be disappointed. There's not one, one thing I've been experimenting with is the best way to do responsiveness. There's a guy out there, I'll put a link to it, that has some good posts on responsive maps and charts. Um, but it's non-trivial with D3, and I hate non-trivial things. I found that with like this map, what I could do is set uh, this preserve aspect ratio property of the SVG to X min Y min and then in the code I set for that head SVG a viewport size as well. What that does is it will just kind of automatically scale stuff for you which is kind of nice. I have that with the chart too but the chart you'll see when I move it in it scales down the fonts and everything so I don't really like that. For that, what I might end up doing, it, probably end up doing, is just store the size of the, the width of the chart. And with a page move, if the container is smaller than the size of that chart, just redraw that chart. I'll probably do something like that. So responsiveness is something you have to think about. 
The other thing I'm going to do probably is replace this drop down with like a, a Twitter type ahead. That way I can put some fancier stuff in there and people can search through it. Those are just a couple tips. And again, this code will be kind of a hot mess if you look at it. I've got at least the bar chart and the map separated out into their own include files. Uh, the bar chart right now is a big mess. The map itself, you can see, is not a whole lot of code. It's pretty clean. And to, it's, it's using TopoJSON. And in the previous iteration, I stored uh, pretty much all the data in that uh, GeoJSON file. And that was a mistake for, for a number of reasons. So now the TopoJSON is just going to have the basically the neighborhood and the neighborhood ID. And in a bunch of other files, like each metric is going to be a CSV, which is more convenient for the, the uh, university people to put the data in, with the neighborhood ID, the first year's value, and the next year's value. And I'll just expand like that as we get more years in. Be a much cleaner way to do it. Anyway, I'll put links to all this stuff in the show notes. And again, my apologies for my absence. I am in fact not dead. And I will try to make some more blog posts and screencasts soon. And that's it. Thanks for watching.